Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us today as we continue the Living Earth Collaborative and EEPB Spring Seminar Series. It is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Sharon Deem for her talk entitled, Turtle Conservation as a Vehicle for One Health. Dr. Deem is the director of the St. Louis Zoo Institute for Conservation Medicine and is a wildlife veterinarian and epidemiologist and a leader in One Health approaches. Dr. Deem holds a doctorate of veterinary medicine from the Virginia, Maryland Re Regional College of Veterinary Medicine and a PhD in veterinary epidemiology from the University of Florida. She also completed a three-year zoo and wildlife medicine residency at the University of Florida, after which she became board certified in the American College of Zoological Medicine. Sharon has conducted conservation medicine and One Health programs globally while training the next generation of One Health practitioners. In fact, Sharon is also an adjunct associate professor at both the University of Missouri Columbia and the University of Missouri St. Louis. She brings years of experience to One Health from her work with zoos, universities, and at field based conservation projects, and has published over 125 scientific papers, as well as many other articles and book chapters, and recently published a textbook titled Introduction to One Health An Interdisciplinary Approach to Planetary Health. Sharon has been the recipient of many awards and honors, including the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019, as well as the 2017 St. Louis Academy of Science Trustees Award. And she was a 2018 honorary inductee of the University of Missouri's Gamma Eta chapter of the Delta Omega Public Health Honorary Society. An awesome fact about Sharon is that when she first started working for the St. Louis Zoo, she was actually based in the Galapagos Islands as a veterinary epidemiologist for the zoo's Wild Care Institute Center for Avian Health, before returning to St. Louis to become the director of the Institute for Conservation Medicine in 2011. As a reminder, please post questions that you have for Sharon in the live chat during her talk, and then we'll read those questions to her at the end. So with that, I wanna thank Dr. Deem for being here today, and I will go ahead and turn it over to her. Great, thank you, Michelle, for that wonderful introduction. And I really appreciate this time to talk about two of my favorite things, turtle conservation and One Health. So what I'd like to do during our time is talk about what One Health is, go over the role of zoos in One Health and focus in on our program at the St. Louis Zoo, this Institute for Conservation Medicine. And then we'll talk a lot about turtles in the next little bit, uh, some interesting facts about them and focus in on three of our programs working with turtles. And, and hopefully we'll have enough time for discussion after this brief presentation. So hope, I, I will think some of you are familiar with One Health, but if not, it is a new approach, a new initiative over about the last 15 years. This article in Science says it's this initiative that aims to merge animal and human health to benefit both. The original logo is sort of this uh, funny little logo, I'd say, with mom and dad and little Bobby in the middle and all those animals and vectors on the outside. And over the last 15 years or so, One Health has really changed a bit to understand and to move forward on this growing understanding of how interconnected health is between human and non-human animals, plants, and the environments that sustain all of us. So one of the definitions of One Health is that it's a collaborative effort of many disciplines working locally, nationally, and globally to obtain optimal health of people, animals, and environments. And, and some of you may be familiar with other similar names such as planetary health, One Medicine, Conservation Medicine, One World, One Health. There are many names that are really all similar in context, in direction, and this growing understanding of how we need to be working across disciplines to come up with solutions to some of the, the, the big conservation and public health challenges of today. So, so why, why One Health? Why in the last 15 years have many disciplines come to together and say, we need to be working at, on teams to think about these challenges? And, 
and and for for me i really think it's our growing understanding of the human global footprint so we are living in the the age of the anthropocene where humans are the drivers of some of our greatest threats to planetary health many of these are irreversible and uh, we we have this power that has had some negative implications recently. And some of those threats listed here, right? So some of the biggies that we think about in One Health, climate change, the loss of biodiversity, emerging infectious diseases, right? Land use change, pollutants, food security questions, wealth inequality, science denialism, we can go on and on about some of those conservation and public health challenges, but I think the really exciting part for me about One Health and the, the growing movement of using One Health as an approach is it's solutions based. We know we have some crises, we know we have some challenges that threaten wildlife conservation, human public health and environmental sustainability, but we also have ways to come up with answers or solutions to some of these greatest challenges that impact all of us today. But how about zoos, right? So as Michelle mentioned, I, I've been with the St. Louis Zoo for 13 years now, and, and my career has mostly been with accredited zoos. And, and I think it's a hidden it's a hidden fact for many people who are within universities of all of the amazing science research and conservation efforts that go on at zoos. A few years ago, we, we published a, a chapter looking at the role of zoological veterinarians within One Health. And, and you see them listed here, some of the, the work that we do, looking at diseases that impact uh, species, endangered species, the healthcare for the sustainability of biodiversity, using zoo animals as sentinels for disease, comparative medicine, disease surveillance, human health benefits from nature, just a number of programs that are being run out of zoos, but also, and a part you're probably a little more familiar with, just the recreational value of zoos and the ability to connect people to conservation issues to engage them and enthuse them about nature. So many different aspects of our zoos are key players within the One Health movement. Here in St. Louis, we're very fortunate. We have a, a, a department dedicated to One Health, and that's the Institute for Conservation Medicine. And if you look at our mission, we take a holistic approach to wildlife conservation, public health, and sustainable ecosystems to ensure healthy animals and healthy people. So briefly, we take a One Health approach. And our patients, I, I would say, are all three of the One Health triad, right? So we care, we, we provide health care for individual animal patients. We look at popu animal population health. There is always a human tied to any animal we treat. Uh, for example, these children in Madagascar around a national park where we work. And then ecosystem health. It, increasingly zoos are working, looking at habitat uh, suitability and environmental health. So the three parts of the triad are all our patients. And ICM, which is our 10th year right now, we have a, a fairly nice global footprint. We have some good programs going on. But for today's talk, I am going to focus in on the work we do with turtles because I think they're a really good example of the One, One Health approach and some of those conservation challenges and some of the solutions we can think about. And uh, we're also kind of crazy about turtles, right? So over many decades, we've been working with different turtle species, and we're just gonna focus in on three of those projects today to give a feel of some of the, the science and outreach uh, that we do using turtles to answer some of these questions. So let's do a little bit of turtles by the number. Uh, to put us all on the same page about uh, just some facts on turtles. So turtles, there's 356 species alive today, extent 
turtle species. We have seven sea turtle species. And here in Missouri, we have 17 species. And this is all um, good and exciting. And hopefully many of you love turtles as much as I do, but you know, turtles are in trouble, right? So we know that greater than 50% of the world's turtles are threatened with extinction. We know that uh, tw up to 20 million turtles and tortoises are consumed in, in Asia each year. If we look at here in the US, we have 57 native turtle species and 40% of them are threatened with extinction. So again, that number for Missouri, we do have 17 turtle species here, which is the second highest for a landlocked state here in the United States. And I just have to say, we have 356 turtle species in the world and we have 356 cool turtle species in the world. But you know, why are turtles in, in crisis, right? And it's sort of the usual suspects of conservation concerns. And we see a, them listed here, the illegal and legal trade in, in turtle species, turtles and tortoises is a huge crisis. Uh, you may have caught Dr. Maris Brand White's LEC talk a few months ago and the work she and others are doing with radiated tortoises and the trade in them in Madagascar. But again, land modifications, ocean and river health changes, pollutants, infectious diseases, invasive species, climate change. I'm sure most of us uh, were paying attention a couple of weeks ago during the climate crisis in Texas and the cold stunning event at a level we haven't seen before. And, and just light and noise pollution, light pollution in particular is a real concern for sea turtle species and their ability to come on shore to lay eggs and navigate appropriately. This is an example of a leatherback turtle that walked into the savanna in Central Africa going to lights of a resort when it, she should have been going back to the moonlit ocean after laying eggs. So all of these challenges are, are working together to lead to this turtle crisis. And as a taxa, turtle, turtle species are one of the most endangered of our wildlife uh, animals. But on the other side, while we think about these challenges for turtles, people love turtles, right? Turtles play a role in culture and religion. This book from 1958, I believe, Men of the Mississippi is this a uh, charismatic little snapping turtle and her uh, travels around the Mississippi, Ninja Turtle, right? Uh, Spike from uh, Nemo. Turtles play a big role in our culture as well as in religion. Many religions use the turtle as some form of, of God within their religions. So this kind of, um, Turtle crisis at the same time of this love of turtles is, a, is an interesting space as we think about how do we conserve the remaining 356 species. So before I, I share our three projects that I'm going to use to kind of think about One Health challenges using turtles, I just want to lay a couple um, quick facts about turtles, and, and hopefully many of you are familiar with this, with these, um, but turtles are ectothermic, right? So they depend on the ex, uh, external temperature. Females lay eggs. They have site fidelity, so they return to nesting sites. Turtle and tortoises uh, like to move, and maybe more than, than you think, and we'll talk a bit about that today. Some turtles brumate, like the box turtles we're going to talk about. They actually brumate during the winter months, and some do not, like the Galapagos tortoises we'll talk about. And most all turtle species are temperature dependent sex determination. So if the eggs that are incubating, if the temperature is low, they're going to be male. And if the temperature is high, they will be female. OK, so those are sort of just some ground facts about turtles that might come in handy as I talk about the projects we're gonna to cover today. 
The first one is uh, near and dear to my heart, and that is the St. Louis Box Turtle Project that we started right here in St. Louis uh, in, in 2012. So we're going on nine years now. And we really started this project because of the understanding the growing threats to turtle species glo globally, the lack of awareness of these threats, right? The lack of scientific information and we found ourselves suddenly living in St. Louis and Forest Park was in our backyard. So we really wanted to take an advantage of understanding the ecology and health of box turtles right here in our backyard. And I wanna just point out before we move on, this is one of our, um, our happy study uh, animals, uh, oops. And you can see the telemetry device here where we use for tracking and an eye button here that we use for temperature determination. And both those we'll, uh, we'll talk about a bit, the data we collect using those. And I just love that this, this policeman and his horse were intrigued by, again, one of our study animals here. So this study uh, we set up uh, in Forest Park and Tyson Research Center. And, and Tyson Research Center with Washington University and Forest Park here in the city. So we had our town turtles and our country turtles, right? We had a, a urban rural, a d two different sites looking at the turtles in these two sites. And over the years, we have now uh, met and notched 378 turtles and 43 of them have been tagged with that little device that again, you can see right there that we can track and get their movements. And we're just gonna talk about a few of the things that we have found over the years uh, during this long-term study. And one, we're gonna think about roads and fitness, right? So uh, many, many people I know um, see box turtles on the roads, uh, running, uh, are interacting with box turtles a great deal here in Missouri. So one of the things we've looked at is the home ranges, right? So the movement of these turtles that we have the telemetry device on. So if you look here at the minimal convex polygon of forest park turtles lower, the, the open circle, and the Tyson turtles, you see a much larger home range, right? Of the Tyson turtles, the turtles out in the forested rural area. And if you look at two of our turtles, we have Kimmy here from Forest Park. Her minimal convex polygon area is one versus Kevin, which we have here 234 hectares, right? So if we think about Missouri, and here's our beautiful state here, and good habitat for turtles, and we look at the road system throughout Missouri, and if we take Kimmy and Kevin and do 100 simulations, placing them in good habitat, right? Kimmy's here in, in blue and Kevin's in red. We see that if we do 100 of these simulations, 61% of the time, Kimmy's gonna cross a road and 100% of those, Kevin's gonna cross a road. And we can see, we can think about what that means for survivorship of these species. One of the studies we did uh, and published a couple of years ago was actually looking at cause specific mortality of these two populations. So Forest Park, our city turtles and Tyson Research Center, the country turtles. And we looked at a number of different possible causes of mortality of these tagged turtles. And you see predation, vehicle, trauma, unknown, and what we call winter kill here. And winter kill is a term used in turtles for those turtles that are brumating over winter and those weeks when they start coming out of brumation and if they die within a week or two, they have died from a winter kill, right? And the difference between Forest Park and Tyson was statistically significant. So more turtles are dying of winter kill in our urban set setting. So we were thinking about some of the possibilities for that. 
So you remember I mentioned those silly little eye buttons that we have on the shell of the turtles, and we also have eye buttons on the surface of the ground, right? And if you look at Forest Park versus Tyson here in the summer months, you see that the surface in both those sites are about the same temperature. But if you look at the temperature of the turtles in Forest Park versus Tyson on their shell, you see a, a, a much hotter environment here on the, the Forest Park turtles. If you do the same thing here in the winter, right, and we're talking about winter kill, you see that the surface of the ground at Tyson and Forest is about the same, and yet the turtles in Tyson are much more cozy in their hibernaculums during the winter months, and their temperature is warmer than those in Forest Park. And if you take this one step further and look at those eye buttons on the shell of the turtles in Forest Park, we see that during the winter months, 22 days, the mean 22% of the days are above freezing, whereas only about eight in Tyson. So we can see how that climate differential may be playing in to the winter kills that we're seeing in this pop these two populations of box turtles. So uh, I have to do one, one, one part of our work on infectious diseases. <laughs> and we, there are a number of infectious diseases that are co uh, conservation challenges for a variety of turtle and tortoise species across the globe. Here in Missouri, we really had very little data about those those pathogens and whether they even existed here in turtle populations. And so we, we, we are looking at herpes virus, adenovirus, ranavirus, and then in this case, mycoplasma, a bacterial infection. And we've published on two of our turtles here in Forest Park, Agatha and Georgette, and their clinical cases of mycoplasma. And hopefully you can see around their nose the characteristic respiratory signs that you see with turtles uh, with an upper respiratory infection. And due to time, I'm not gonna go too much into depth here, but if we want to in chat, we can look into this farther, but very interesting their movement data that goes with infection both pre and post and what that may mean for uh, this infectious disease. First time it's been uh, been shown to be present here in Missouri. So that's going to be your only infectious disease I have to mention uh, during this talk. But what I want to do is move over to our sister project, and you're going to see that much of what we're, we're doing with the giant tortoises, the Galapagos tortoises, is very similar to what we're doing with the box turtles in, in, here in St. Louis. And this project began in 2010 by Dr. Stephen Blake, and you can see him here putting a GPS telemetry device on one of the tortoises up on Al Cedo Volcano, which is one of the volcanoes in the Galapagos Islands, which if you're not familiar, are about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador and this archipelago of um, about 14 big islands. And this project when it started was really Let's understand the movement of these, these giants of the Galapagos. Very little was known about the movement. And with time, we added a health component. And I think you'll see some of the, you know, here we are in the middle of islands in the Pacific and some of the things we just thought about with box turtles in the middle of Missouri, St. Uh, USA. So, the information that has come out, and there's many great publications from Dr. Blake and others on understanding the movement of these tortoises. And we've known about giant tortoises since the time of Darwin, and yet very little was known about how they're using their habitat. And so the study has found now that Galapagos tortoises 
many of the species are partial migrate migrators. So here we are on Santa Cruz Island, the lowlands by the ocean here up to the highlands and you can see this migration route right and you'll notice here this is nesting zone one nesting zone two and nesting zone three along this altitudinal gradient and that will come in uh, value in the next few slides so in this study, wow, these tortoises are migrating across the island. And what does that mean in terms of conservation uh, challenges in the present into the future? And I just wanna point out as well, as you see this altitudinal gradient from the lowlands here, sea level, this is about 150 meters on up into the farmland and where there's a lot of human footprint. Right, so we see this migration taking place. So one of the, the things we wanted to look at, similar to the box turtles, is fitness and, and how that might impact with roads. So a study from a few years ago we published looked at total protein values within the tortoises that don't migrate versus the tortoises that do. Lo and behold, if you migrate, your protein level is higher. Also, your body condition is higher if you're a migrator. And lastly, we know as your body condition index goes up, your, your number of eggs and follicles also go up. So you're more reproductively successful. So migration may be a very valuable thing in the long-term survival of these species. And yet we also know with the growing human footprint in Galapagos, that the migratory routes are being increasingly uh, stopped or um, overlapped with roads and fences and other human uh, structures. And then the other part we looked at, again, similar to the box turtle study, is climate and fitness, right? So we have this uh, amazing iconic creature of Galapagos that is laying eggs and what, what, what might be happening with climate uh, changes and coming climate changes. So we looked at egg health, right? And those nesting zones I mentioned, so down sea level, the, the middle range and the upper range. And if you look at the egg weight of these uh, nests we looked at, you see much more robust eggs in that middle zone. So, Heavier females have heavier eggs, probably more fit in that mid zone. And if you look at egg mortality, you see it increases as you go up that elevation. And much of this is due to rainfall changes along that elevational uh, change across the nesting zones. Then we also looked at the hatchlings, right? So we thought about egg mortality, egg fitness, and we followed these hatchlings for a number of years. And again, you can see that middle, middle zone, uh, the weight of these hatchlings increased above those of those other two nesting zones, and that the survival of those hatchlings in that middle zone is higher. The survivorship is better for that, that middle nesting zone. So that's where you wanna lay your eggs if you're a Galapagos tortoise on Santa Cruz Island. And lastly, with this climate question, we wanted to understand the sex ratio of these uh, turtles. So you can't really see it, unfortunately, but right there is about a 20 gram turtle hatchling, or excuse me, tortoise, Galapagos tortoise, and we're doing laparoscopy to determine if it's male or female. And across those nesting zones, we have shown that your probability of being a male increases as you go up that elevation, right? It gets cooler. And so remember, cool, cooler is, is male versus the warmer weather, the warmer uh, air down at sea level is more likely to be female. 
So this is a, an evolving, <laughs> evolving story as we're looking at all these various parameters of reproductive success of the Lopagus tortoises at a time where we're just starting to understand climate change issues that are impacting the Galapagos. And what we see impacts on survivability, fitness, from eggs to hatchling to adults, as well as possibly a sex ratio change as temperatures change in these nesting zones. So that's a little bit of a teaser because we're those data are just starting to give us some understanding as climate change uh, is is happening as we know everywhere. And then lastly, I want to just share uh, uh, one more uh, story on some of the turtle work we're doing. And, and this one I think is particularly timely. And uh, yesterday on the local news, for those of you in St. Louis, we just learned that St. Louis will be one of the cities and part of this United Nation environmental program where we're looking at plastics in the Mississippi River, right? And we're looking at uh, this the, the, the impact of plastics in our river systems. And I have a feeling most of us uh, are not surprised at how um, significant a problem this is. But what has been less looked at is sort of those chemicals within plastics and the impacts they may have on across taxa on all species, including humans. So some of the work we've been doing over the last few years is to look at BPA, bisphenol A, and its impact on turtle species and, and hopefully to use that not just for turtle conservation, but as a model for humans and other animals. And so um, I mentioned, right, temperature dependent sex determination. And uh, so if the temperature is low, we have cool dudes. If it's high, we have hot babes. And, and in our study animal for, for this work, we use painted turtles and they follow this temperature dependent sex determination uh, pattern. So cooler temperatures, we get males, hotter temperatures, we get females. So what does this have to do with BPA and endocrine disruptors, right? Well, what we did was we took uh, painted turtles and we incubated them at male producing temperatures. So they 100% should be males because they were below that threshold where you're gonna be a boy or a girl. And then at that period in incubation that we know that sex is determined in, in turtles, we expose them to different, la la different levels of bisphenol A. And all three of these levels we expose them to are environmentally relevant. They are in our, our rivers and streams. And so we exposed them and said, what, what, what is, what, what's gonna happen? And we looked at their gonads, right? So uh, histology shot here. So a control male gonad and a control female. And you can see the nice cortex here, the female, and you don't see that in the male. And if you look at the, the gonads of the, the, the eggs that were incubated at male producing temperatures, they no longer have testes. They have what we call ovo testes. So they've been feminized. And if we look at the, the, the study, we see that 33% of these eggs, all of the hatchlings should have been male and 33% were feminized after exposure to environmentally relevant BPA. So the, 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 the micro chemicals within the plastics that are in our environment. And we, we took the study, there's a few other parts to this study. We took the study one step farther and I, Michelle might have to wave for me. I think um, because of time, I, I won't go to this, uh, this wonderful little um, video that if you want to stop your YouTube, if, if, if you're watching this and, and check it out, it shows that not only do we have these anatomical changes, we have done behavioral changes of these turtles. So at nine months, 
they are behaving like females. They, we, we did food mazes and they, they acted more like females than males. So we're seeing that these environmentally relevant endocrine disruptors are having both anatomical and behavioral changes on turtles. So um, lots of turtle talk. <laughs> I wanna bring it full circle and put, put it into perspective of why I thought this would be a good way to introduce One Health. I think when, uh, first of all, turtles are amazingly cool, they are amazingly threatened, and they're facing so many challenges that are similar for other taxa as well as humans. And we have those challenges listed there. We also, in all this work I've presented, all the work we do for turtle conservation, we have a multidisciplinary One Health approach. So we have ecologists and biologists and veterinarians and educators and uh, we have an environmental uh, engineer. We have all these different disciplines working together to look at these uh, challenges. And I really feel that so much of these programs, we're doing the science, we do the outreach, and we hope that they're informing conservation action, which is really what One Health should be about. And it's the mission of the zoos as well. And lastly, I think when we think about turtles and using them as a model for One Health, I mean, they're doing everything but flying. They live in the land, they live in rivers, they live in oceans. They're ecosystem engineers. They can be predator or prey, and they're often sent sentinels of environmental health, such as the BPA studies that we've been doing. And again, lastly, I mean, people love turtles. So the outreach we've done both in Galapagos as well as in Missouri, we've, we've taken hundreds, if not thousands of, of young uh, up and coming conservationists out to meet turtles and tortoises. And the St. Michael School, a local school, the third and fourth graders even wrote a book that you can buy on Amazon about one of our turtles, Georgette, and uh, her story. And lastly, picture says a thousand words that the, the, the ability to use these iconic little creatures to engage people to think about the health of their environment the health of animal species that they share the environment with, as well as their own health has really been uh, just so um, amazing through our work, both in St. Louis, as well as in the Galapagos. So turtles are a real vehicle for that One Health outreach. And I'll just end uh, by saying, uh, you know, the work I'm presenting here, many PIs, many CIs, some of them may be listening and may help out with questions, I don't know, and lots of different funders, lots of different organizations. For those of you who are interested in our box turtle and Galapagos tortoise programs, we have Facebook uh, presence, we have an Instagram present, presence, and I'd be happy to share those with you uh, if you can't find them on your own. So thank you very much for your time. And hopefully I, I left enough time for uh, any discussion, uh, comments, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk, Sharon. Um, so I just want to remind everyone to please post questions in the chat. And Sasha and I are going to relay those questions to Sharon. So the first question that we have is from John Birmingham Jr. who says, have forest park turtles learned to avoid roads? Yeah, John, that's a, a great question. What I didn't go into, I didn't go into a lot of our nine year study, but what we're seeing, so it's primarily the three-toed box turtle and they tend to like forested areas the most. And if you look at forest park, we have patches of forest. And many of them do not leave those patches. So whether that's because they're, they're, they're forest loving turtles 
are they've learned to avoid roads? I, I can't answer. What I can say that that mycoplasma story, if you if you want to find that um, PDF, and if you can't find it, I'll send it to you. The mycoplasma animals with this infectious disease actually moved more and crossed roads. So there was a link between leaving those forested areas and crossing roads. Thank you, Sharon. Um, that was a really fun talk. I love your talks. Um, so actually, we have a question about the opportunities to volunteer with your program here um, that maybe you could elaborate on. I guess you talked about that a little bit at the end, but Jose Itzaraga, Itzaraga, excuse me, wants to know if um, the Box Turtle Project has or will accept any volunteers. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jose. Uh, we, we use a lot of volunteers. It's um, it, it's a pro, it's a program that has a, a lot of players. So the St. Louis Zoo, St. Louis University, Washington University, um, and there are ways to get involved. I think the the best way might be just to email me, and I can contact you with the right people. In this day of COVID, and I can't believe I gave a One Health talk and never said the word COVID. Um, that just blows me away. I get so excited about turtles. Uh, so things are a little bit harder right now in terms of volunteering, but uh, so, many, so many of our programs are outreach um, and we work a lot with different schools. We, we have had many volunteers work with us. So maybe the best way is to contact me and, and we can see what your situation is and, and whether there's something that can work out. I, I'll, I will comment that, you know, we also have had a number of interns over the years and those, if they come through the zoo, there is an application to sign to, to become an intern with, with one of these projects. Great, that's really cool. Um, so the next question is from Nicholas Bauer, who says, how might the endocrine disruption affect wild populations of turtles? Would we see the same effects as in the lab? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, there, there are a number of studies now that are really showing the population impact. In 2015, we published a, a review paper that really shows all the studies up to that time on amphibian fish and turtles. And sort of the, some of those are laboratories, some of them are uh, in the in the wild uh, and, and the impacts that are happening. So I, I think um, there's a lot more we need to know from the turtle side. The, the area that I think there's the most data on is the intersex issues with fishes, so different fish species in different river systems. I personally think it's a, a hugely important growing area of research, both from the non-human and human animal perspective. Uh, you, you may have seen, those of you interested in endocrine disruptors, there's a brand new book out called Countdown that just came out and it's about the impacts of endocrine disruptor chemicals on the, the human male and the impact on sperm count and sperm quality and just some of those same impacts that we're seeing on turtles that may be ha happening in the human male uh, subject as well. It's a great question. It's a huge area. It's probably a semester long talk that I gave you in about six minutes. Um, <laughs> Great. Um, here we have one from Wensi Kuo who asks, would you feel surprised that turtles based on a temperature dependent sex determination system can survive millions of years on the earth um, and survive through several ancient climate changes? Yeah, that's it. That's an yeah, that's it. That's an interesting uh, question or a comment. I, I really like that. I think, you know, one of the big questions in turtle conservation right now, particularly the sea turtle community, as we see beaches uh, warm up, and there's been a number of, of publications now about that sex ratio being skewed 
to more females, right? And maybe more females is good because it doesn't take many males, as many as it does females, but there's a lot of discussion right now about what that might mean. I think your question is a great philosophical one. I'm not 100% sure how to answer it. I do, I do want to point out one thing, though, that you, you do say in that question is how these are one of the most long-lived taxa that's out there, and on our watch, they are going extinct. And how sad is that, right? So they have survived through those, those global changes, and yet with the human threats upon them, many of them we are driving to extinction. Yeah, that's a that's a really sad point, <laughs> um, but true. Yeah. Um, so I guess some questions that I had um, that I wanted to ask were: Have you been monitoring the? I know that you mentioned um, that you looked at environmental temperature as well between Tyson and Forest Park with the box turtle project. Um, is there? large differences in the ability of the turtles to find good brumation sites between those two locations? Or is it just generally that Forest Park is warmer or has maybe less um, temperature heterogeneity within the environment? Great, great question. We, uh, and uh, we're, we're still analyzing things, but overall our take is that it is much easier to find good hibernaculum in forest or excuse me in tyson there's a better understory there's more leaf cover there's just the ability is is so much better there than in forest park is it you know one of the things that i didn't mention at all in this talk because this is like a pandora's box i'm about to mention is you know here we are in Forest Park in 1904. We had the World Fair. It was totally changed. We are not sure of the population in Forest Park. Did they immigrate back into the area? Are some of them pet drop-offs, so they don't know how to brumate as well as let's say the ones out in Forest or excuse me Tyson. So there's still some unanswered questions there that um, may help us understand that a bit better. But it's a great question. Hey, Sharon. So actually, your um, talk has inspired a little ongoing chat behind the scenes here. So I'm going to relay a question that came up. Um, we're wondering if uh, we think of One Health as aiming to achieve these optimal outcomes for humans, animals, and the environment. Kind of, you've already listed some of them with the education, but what are some potential benefits to human health that these projects might offer eventually? Yeah, you know? I love that question. So, what is? Uh, we'll start with the endocrine disruptor uh, story. I, I, there is so much interest right now in understanding these chemicals that are we are a washing, right? Uh, fetuses are surrounded by it in our amniotic fluid. We know endocrine disruptors are a growing concern for human health. And so to, to increase our understanding through animal models, whether it's uh, looking at experimentally like the, the information I shared or population level studies are really helping us understand how big of a problem these chemicals are. I think on the other side, if we think about climate change and, and you know, if we're feminizing a temperature dependent um, uh, uh, species, right, which is a totally different system than ours, I understand, but we're seeing how environmental changes are leading to these, these uh, hidden, potentially hidden changes. If we look at some of the um, pollutant work, the infectious diseases, you know, all I did was give you one slide on mycoplasma, but if we look at the emerging infectious diseases of turtle and tortoise conservation, wow, is that ever an interesting parallel to emerging infectious diseases in human populations today? And the spillover and the possibility of how these emerging pathogens are, are really uh, having significant impacts on the human species, but a number of other animal species as well. So I think there's a lot of parallels there. The, the other thing I didn't talk about in this talk um, 
is, you know, I mentioned how we've taken hundreds, if not thousands of kids out to meet a turtle, to get excited about nature and get out there. Some of the studies we've done and published on is the human health benefits of interacting with an animal, of being in nature and going to Forest Park. You know, we show lower blood pressure and lower cortisol level, and you're just happier and less tense. So that's a One Health connection right there by getting these kids away from their video games and, and their screens and, and get them out there. And so there are health benefits in our society where obesity and chronic illnesses are really playing into some of the, the health challenges for the human species. Good question. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really, really interesting and really fantastic. Um, so the next question we have is from Aaron Shamley, who asks, you talked about some turtle behavior determining fitness, like the Galapagos tortoises migrating. Um, are there other turtle species with behavior that can act as similar fitness tests? I'm not sure I know how to answer this question. I guess uh, the one video I didn't show that one minute video of the maze of the, of the turtles, the, uh, the endocrine disruptor study, when we what we did was we looked at these animals that were either exposed to bisphenol A or not exposed, and we know that turtle behavior uh, differs in their food finding capabilities. And females, female turtles are better at finding the food in the real world. And so these males that have been feminized were better at finding the food. And there may be ecological reasons for that, like reproductive capability of these egg laying females. So the impact of this change, this anthropogenic change of endocrine disruptors may be changing that fitness, uh, that fitness of the males. And, and so to t and that might not have been that clear, but to take that one step farther is if we with if these endocrine disruptors are changing males feeding uh, behaviors, maybe it's changing their behaviors to find suitable females. So there's some unanswered questions there about that behavior. And again, that anthropogenic impact that may be influencing that behavior. I was gonna ask if you wanted to, I have a couple questions for you, but if, if you wanted to show that video since we have a little time here, and if not, that's fine. But I'm happy to. People okay. are, this is great that people are interested. Yeah. Do you want me to go to it? Yeah, I do. Okay. You do got it. Let's do it. Here. <laughs> uh, let's see. It's not here. So let's see if it comes up when I do this. Yeah. Here it goes. You ready? You see it? Uh, no, not right now. Turtles need to find their way to mate, eat. I'm going to have to do Blades. one thing real quickly. No problem. Because I have it on PowerPoint. So I'm oh, going to yeah. share the other way. Here we go. Now you can see it. Yep. Okay, here we go. Turtles need to find their way to mate, eat, and lay eggs but chemicals in their environment may alter that ability. Researchers at the University of Missouri Bond Life Sciences Center recently found bisphenol A and other estrogen-like hormones affected that navigation. BPA is used to make plastics and leaches out into rivers and streams, where it is widespread and can impact animals and humans. Using water mazes, they tracked how well turtles found food that was only present on one of four pedestals. This spatial navigation is critical in the wild. BPA sex reverses behavior, making male turtles act more like females. In essence, they find the food more quickly. The next step for scientists will be to study if this behavior translates into chemical or physical changes in the brain. For the Bond Life Sciences Center, I'm Roger Meissen. It should say the Bond Life Sciences Center and the St. Louis Zoo. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Um, 
I wait, now I forgot the question I was going to ask. Um, oh, yes, back to the uh, box turtles, uh, Forest Park box turtles, I guess, and Tyson also. What are some of the other mortality factors? And uh, it sounded like overwinter mortality was the, the greatest, but what are some of the other ones that you run across? So there, and the question earlier about cars, uh, we have had a number of car strikes. We've had lawn mowers long mower strikes and and for those of uh the folks listening uh that mow your lawn you know a, a six inch blade helps with uh turtle conservation um and keeping an eye out especially if you have a regular sized yard you can look for turtles before lawn mowing uh, we also have some predation uh both natural and dog predation we've had a a, a couple of our our turtles that have died of predation but the question is as many of us know in wildlife health studies was the turtle or the animal debilitated before predated because box turtles are call, called box turtles because they can close up and put all their soft tissue inside a box but if they can't close up and the dog can get to their leg or, or something. We, we've seen some predation. And also this question of infectious diseases that I didn't go into. Um, we know in our sister state of Illinois and a number of other states, there have been ronavirus uh, epidemics that have really led to die-offs of turtle populations. We are not sure of that situation here in Missouri. We have, uh, in the last couple months, um, had the first detected clinical ronavirus box turtle with our colleagues at the Baldwin Wildlife uh, Center um, and looking at that. So we're trying to understand sort of the level of ronavirus infections here in, in Missouri. And again, before we started the project in 2012, in this state, there wasn't a lot of health work or even movement work that had happened in Missouri. A wonderful couple, um, husband wife team in the 70s had done some great movement studies. There's a monograph out there of their studies with the old time kind of capabilities. But after that, there was really very little work that's gone on in Missouri. And I can't believe I haven't said this. The three-toed box turtle is your state reptile of Missouri. Okay, so I think we have time for one last question. Maybe two, but maybe not. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Matthew Austin who says, I'm curious how often the public interferes with tracking turtles in Forest Park. Have any track turtles had their monitors removed or been re relocated by the public? Love it. Good question. So we have had um, two of our uh, telemetry turtles uh, kidnapped and uh, seriously kidnapped. But within 24 hours, one of them, they saw our Facebook page. They saw we were doing a study. They contacted us and realized that it was part of a study and brought it back to us in, in Forest Park. So um, I think that was a good Samaritan thinking this poor turtle had some scientific device on it, not realizing. Uh, another one has uh, did go AWOL. One, but, but again, one of the questions is, as many of you know, um, is it is it battery life of the telemetry device? Did something go wrong and they're really out there? We just haven't run into them again or were they taken away? But um, I, I do love the question because we, we when we started this project eight, nine years ago, we really were kind of worried about that. For those of you who spend time in Forest Park, the number of people I have met over the years that li have lived in St. Louis their whole lives and said, I've never seen a box turtle. And then you go, oh, well, there's one. And, and then, so I think uh, just that understanding of box turtles being part of um, our ecosystems here in Missouri is, is something that is, is not on a lot of people's radar. All right, I'm gonna go for it and squeeze this one last question in. I think we're done. Um, we have one from Jess Carrig here, who you know very well. Um, do we know of any human diseases that could potentially spill over into turtles or tortoises um, as our habitats become increasingly overlapped? 
Great question. I don't think I do. And I don't, if anyone's at the chat box and, and thinks of, think, thinks of one, the one that, you know, turtles and human sharing of, of pathogens is not big on our concern for human health, like let's say rodents or bats or non-human primates. The one most people are familiar with is salmonella, uh, going from the turtles to humans. I'm not thinking one offhand, but if anyone types it in to the chat, that's great. Um, I'm not as worried from, well, as we know in the day of COVID, uh, anything can happen, um, but there's none that comes to mind, human to turtle. I think it's the hit by car, it's the pollutants, it's the lawnmowers, it's your dog's land changes. Great. Well, thank you again, Sharon, for this really fantastic talk and interesting discussion. Um, and to everyone else as well for tuning in. So we hope you will continue to join us as our seminar series continues next week. Thank you again. Thank you.